that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. That is the traditional appointed college for today's service. And although we have been using the prayers for an inclusive church as our college since Advent, today's traditional one grabbed my attention in a way that I just couldn't shake. Perhaps it was the language dripping with compassion. Perhaps it's the global concerns with Russia, Ukraine, Taiwan, and China. Perhaps it's more local with jobs and housing, pandemic or school concerns. Perhaps it was the way it sets the tone for today's service, today's particular imposition. An imposition that is uncomfortable, lumpy, and charred. Whatever it is that we are met with this day, in all its variety, for me, I find that this palette centers me. It grounds me in such a way that gives me space to remember my and the world around me collective wretchedness. My own contrite heart and longing for perfect remission and forgiveness. I think when I used to hear this word, I thought it meant something bad. But in actuality, it's much worse. The dictionary defines wretchedness to be very unhappy or unfortunate to suffer greatly. It's a hard word to wrestle with, especially in a culture that likes things buttoned up neat and tidy, in a culture that values filters and edits. As though this very college is calling upon the unformed parts of our hearts that tell us we aren't worthy of love and belonging. That we can't give ourselves compassion when we make a mistake, say the wrong thing, sniff at a spouse, or get grumpy with an innocent bystander. But God whispers to us in the words of this prayer, through this liturgy, that all of us are held in his loving embrace. That these impositions we put upon ourselves are not for God's benefit, but for ours. For our relationship to the divine as their beloved, and for our relationship with one another. I don't know about you, but I was kind of hoping for a less Lenty Lent. I was kind of hoping for more of a light violet, rather than a deep purple, almost black. But Lent is the time in which we are invited to ponder the ways in which we are suffering, either individually or in our world. The ways in which we are unhappy or unfortunate. Kind of like the way it feels when the ashes are imposed upon our foreheads, as the priest reminds us that from dust I come, and to dust I shall return. The ashes are the cremains of the palm branches we used last year to sing Hosanna, as Jesus rode through Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. How quickly we digress. How quickly we slip into our fragile and less than full understanding of how grace has manifest for us. And while I was not present with Jesus on the mountain, with him throughout Galilee to hear his teachings, nor present with him as he made his way to the cross, I do find the season of Lent to provide for me a way to make my own kind of pilgrimage through the stories of the sacred texts in a discipline of prayer, fasting, and meditating upon God's holy word. In this particular part of the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus is up the mountain with his disciples, teaching them deep principles of practicing the way of love, which he began with the, the Beatitudes in chapter 5 followed by all kinds of rich teachings that make us uncomfortable on things like being salt and light, the law and prophets, anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, love for enemies. Jesus' teachings to his disciples were about relationships, and specifically reconciliation. He tells his disciples, Beware of practicing your piety before others. Whenever you give alms, whenever you pray, whenever you fast. 
Jesus reminds us to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consume, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The way of love is and always has been about right relationship with our Creator, one another, and all of creation. And remembering that there is always a pathway back into right relationship when we fall astray. Lent provides a way for us to sharpen our discipleship skills, hone in on our own belovedness, and orient our hearts toward service to the world in the name of Jesus. Jesus' way of love was about liberating us from the bondage of sin, from the big lie that we were ever separated from the divine in the first place. About showing us what love looks like, and providing a way of being that is life-giving. Discipleship at its core is about love. It's about relationships. It's about discipleship. It's about uh, discipline. The church, in light of these themes of Lent, has provided for you a gift bag for all of us to walk together through Lent at home. They contain a calendar with a daily word or scripture to meditate with, an icon to focus our intentions and prayers for the season, and a devotional to use at your own pace. We also included flyers about the formational offerings that will take place. You are invited to take one home, explore the resources, and participate as you're able. You can grab one from the fellowship hall on your way out. However you discern to observe this holy Lent, we pray that your heart is enriched, your sense of discipleship emboldened, and your care for self and one another renewed. We are God's beloved community, called to this fellowship.